we have to look at it holistically, the post-retirement area. We have to also look at health, we have to look at housing, we have to look at aged care services. So we have to revisit, revision post-retirement, I think, and actually look at the whole package. I think it is important um, that Henry, looking at super contributions tax, looks at the system over the next 20 or 30 years. Secondly, and I don't think this is appreciated by, by some in the super industry, a key element of that is going to be the level of age pension because um, there's a relationship between superannuation contributions and outcomes and the age pension. Um, a lift in the age pension, for example, lifts overall retirement incomes. I think where the adjustments need to be made is um, the equity in relation to taxation of contributions within the system. Um, that's always been an issue where people at the lower end uh, of the income scale have paid probably far more than they actually do in income tax. AIST and ISN did a submission into the Henry Review and we made a no number of recommendations that were, were around improving adequacy but also fixing some of the efficiencies. And what our paper showed was that if you did fix some of the inefficiencies in the system, you perhaps didn't need to put up contributions as far as 15%. Maybe you didn't need to put them up at all. I'm nervous about change that, that might have not been well thought through. I mean, we've seen often um, uh, change being announced by government by media release uh, and then legislation follows. There's always difficulty in, in trying to work out how to implement that in the best interests of members. So I'm nervous in that sense. Um, I've just got a, an open mind about uh, what, what the changes might be. It's still early days, so I think we have to wait and see. But I think we need to look at the retirement phase. Instead of saying age 65 is kind of where it is, we need to say, no, it's, it's another good 20, 30 years down the track. In terms of getting anything in the foreseeable future, in terms, particularly in relation to superannuation and in relation to fundamental structures, I, I would say to most people, don't hold your breath waiting. I think we should uh, get rid of all financial planners. We should let the federal government run the whole thing completely. We pay our money into the federal government. They use the money for infrastructure, for the betterment of our country, and guarantee us a reasonable rate of return. I think that would be a much better system than what we've got now. I think it's pretty hard to imagine that anybody in Australia is unaware that this review is underway and I think that it represents probably the best opportunity we'll have in a generation to comprehensively review retirement incomes uh, and the retirement income system we've got to secure the optimal outcome for Australians, uh, Australian workers. We've assembled a panel of, of people eminently qualified to speak on the, on the topic. They've been very key in the development of the submissions their entities have made to uh, the Commission. And uh, if you've read those submissions, you'll, you'll be aware that there are many, many similarities and, and in fact, uh, fewer differences between the independently uh, put together uh, submissions. Uh, I don't propose to bore you by giving you a, a great long uh, in, in, uh, introduction to each of them because they're, they're all particularly well known. I mean, uh, introducing uh, Fiona Reynolds to uh, a conference of CMSF is sort of like introducing uh, Rupert Murdoch to a dollar. So you all know that uh, Fiona is the chief executive of, of AIST, that she's been running these con conferences for many years and that she's eminently qualified to speak on, on superannuation matters. To her left is Louise Beattie, who is uh, chair of the FPA and co-founder and director of Strategy Steps, an organisation which is an independent boutique business which provides technical support to financial planners. She too has played a major role in the submission made made by the Financial Planners Association. Linda Howes, uh, the person in the middle there, is the Director of Policy and Industry Practice at, at ASFA. She's overcome the trauma of being uh, trained as an actuary uh, and she has spent many, many years uh, in the financial services industry and has great practical experience. The first of the two token blokes uh, on the table is Richard Gilbert. Rich is the Chief Executive Officer of IFSA. Uh, He's uh, the voice of the financial services segment in the country, more noted in my view for the fact that he was secretary to uh, the Senate Select Committee on Superannuation in the 90s and 
played a very, very significant role in the development of our system in those early days. And finally, um, free from his media uh, commitments, at the end of the table is David Whiteley, uh, the executive manager of the Industry Super Network, uh, which is responsible for the coordination of the industry fund collective strategies, particularly the one around the Compare the Pair advertising campaign. And he is the fellow who, who brings Bernie Fraser to your, your screen, TV screens. And so, Fiona, if you would like to kick off the batting. Thanks, Sandy. Um, with our submission to the Henry Review, uh, we undertook it in conjunction with ISN, and we um, employed Access Economics to do the modelling for us. Importantly, we had a steering committee that included representatives of AIST and ISM, but also had representatives from the AI group and from the ACTU. And we felt that it was very important to have broad union and employer support. With our submission, we consulted widely, so we talked to a range of not-for-profit superannuation funds about what we were thinking. And we also consulted with another number of other organisations, particularly with the Institute of Actuaries, to get some of their ideas. And we came at our submission basically from two directions. Increased efficiencies, which David will focus on, and equity. These were our recommendations that are up on this slide. And we started with at looking at our submission from the point of view of, well, if we're doing a submission to talk about the adequacy of retirement incomes, what actually is an adequate retirement? And I have to say, surprisingly, because you'd think there would be one, we found that there really wasn't a, an agreed definition of what adequacy was. Some people say it needs to be 65% of you know, your, final balance, your final salary. Some people say you need to get to 15%. Some say nine's quite enough. We don't need to do any more. So the first thing that we thought was that, the, and the first recommendation that we made was that the government needs to define what adequacy is. And we think that by defining adequacy, that that means that you can set policy around the definition and you can have policy that drives the de definition. So what we did basically for want of a better definition or for reinventing the wheel is we used the um, SPRC standard that has been developed for Westpac and ASPA that I'm sure that most of you are quite familiar with. Familiar with. And we decided that there needed to be a floor and a ceiling in terms of government assistance when it comes to saving for your retirement. With the floor, we basically said that the first policy priority should be for us to get as many Australians as possible to the, that modest amount, which is around nine, which is nineteen thousand six hundred and seventy-one dollars, and that the second priority should be then to get as many Australians as we possibly could to the next amount, which is thirty-eight thousand dollars per annum in retirement. After that, and this is, I suppose, where our ceiling comes in, we still, of course, want people to be in the superannuation system and we still want people to save. But we think at some point there needs to be a limit on when the government subsidies end. For example, if you've got millions and millions of dollars in super, should the government still be subsidising you to put more money in? Or should that be, once you get to a certain upper limit, where your tax-free super at 60, for example, ends. We didn't pretend to come up with all the answers, but we certainly posed all the questions there. When we then went about with Access Economics in modelling our ideas and to look at whether it was achievable. And one of the things that we said was that you should increase the age pension for the single person to $16,000. So when we looked at could we get everyone to the first level, we found that pretty much it would be fairly easy to do so because we know that average balances at the moment are about 150,000 for men and 70,000 for women. And in our modelling that's up there on the, uh, up there, if you increase the age pension, then you need a lump sum of about $60,000 to get everyone for that first level. And then to get people to the next level, the second level where we like, where it's a much more comfortable retirement, we made another a number of other recommendations that inclu included some increased efficiencies, which hopefully we'll talk about as the time goes by. Thank you. That four minutes goes quickly. Um, from an FPA point of view, it's actually interesting listening to Fiona's because I think a lot of the questions that um, 
that was going through there were the same sorts of issues that we approached as well. We looked at that the Australian superannuation system is fundamentally a sound system and one that many other countries look at and try to learn from. However, we still see many people um, inadequately repaired for, prepared for retirement and the longevity issues are becoming exacerbated and really not at all well understood by people. When we went through putting our submission together, we took um, extensive member consultation across our, the FPA's membership base, taking and drawing from experience that they have with their clients and the, the issues that they're facing and what's working and what's not working well for them, and had a committee that put it together, which I chaired. I think I drew the short straw this year. The three pillars that we see in the superannuation system with the compulsory super, voluntary savings and the age pension, over time we've had a lot of changes, but they've been changed largely in isolation. They're not integrated well and that creates some anomalies and it means you have people that will try to work through one system at the detriment of the other. So we've looked at and taking a view that we need a much more lifetime view of retirement. It needs to start from birth and we need to have a rolling series of savings agendas that work towards retirement savings. So we've looked at a system where we have a child savings plan um, that then can roll into a medium term savings plan or the first home savers account and that in turn can roll into superannuation if it hasn't been used for other purposes along the way. So we believe that a lot of what we need to do there is regulatory change, but there's also a very big cultural shift um, that we need to promote within the community as well. A lot of that change in savings behaviour and motivating people is largely going to be driven by education, by access to advice. And so our submission did focus on a number of ways of making advice affordable and more achievable, some ways of getting tax concessions for the fees that they pay. Um, because we believe that will actually help to encourage people to seek advice as well. There is a lot of literature out in, in, in the industry and in the public environment, but a lot of people don't learn well by just reading. They really do need access to somebody who can show them the practical implications, do comparisons and help them understand what's happening for their own situation and to help them actually take ownership of their decisions. And I think that's the big thing for our clients, that they need to own their investment decisions they need to own them as being appropriate for their own circumstances um, and then be able to implement them as well. It was interesting, or it's actually rather scary when you look at some research that Mercer had done, which we um, used in our submission, that shows that 35% of baby boomers have little or no preparation for retirement. So maybe if we looked in this room, it'd be interesting to see if we get that same sort of statistic. But that's an awful lot of people who have just are very close to retirement and haven't even looked at um, their plans adequately as well. So we believe that the access and value of advice is, is really important there. With our submissions, some of the specific areas, and we can go through them if, with questions, but um, just to give you some ideas, specifically we looked at increasing the level of SG, um, more from a soft compulsion level up to 12% in the initial stage anyway, and also widening the reach of it. We know we've got a problem with self-employed people who don't have um, the incentive or the access to using superannuation, the same as an employed person. Looking at trying to extend it to non-working people and to older workers to encourage older participation in the workforce as well. Some measures around increasing voluntary savings. Um, some of those we looked at was allowing all people under the age of 75 to make contributions to super without a work test and also to all be eligible to make personal deductible contributions to get rid of the inequity between somebody who works for an employer that allows salary sacrifice and somebody who doesn't. Looking at an income stream culture, we think that we really need to promote that culture um, and particularly what we'd like to see is legislation become more flexible to allow product innovation. The innovation in the retirement income space is so very, very limited by the construct of legislation and doesn't address longevity. And I think that one of the really key things as well, just to finish off, is our um, position on the age pension and where that should go. We've proposed some reasonably radical changes to the age pension. When it was first introduced um, in 1900, it, we had 4% of the population over age 65. So we're going to have a problem funding that when you think about the percentage of population in that age group now. We've looked at a two-tiered 
system of age pension, um, where once you get to age 80, there's a higher level of age pension that cuts in, and that can be more um, rigidly means tested or eligibility tested. But the idea is that at those point, that point in time, a higher pension to help cover the aged care and health costs. We're also looking at a single deeming rate so that we don't have this interaction between income and assets test, that it is just one um, streamlined test as well, and also streamlining concessions. So in summary, a lot of it is around the adequacy and um, those issues, and I agreed a lot with what Fiona was saying about the way they look at it, changes to the age pension and access to advice. Okay, I'm just going to focus on a couple of key issues from our submission because there's a lot of commonality. Um, the goal, um, we also think there should be a goal for a national goal for an adequate retirement income because that's the result we're all trying to achieve. I think our, our thoughts were fairly similar to AIST's. Um, ASFA's um, idea was to have everyone aiming for 70% of their after tax income with a minimum of the modest Westpac ASFA retirement index. So I think there's, there's a lot of commonality there. But what I want to focus on is how do we get there? Um, what affects someone, someone's adequacy? Well, the four key things are the contribution rate, the years they're going to work, their investment return, and then how long they live in retirement, so how long does their benefit have to last them for. So when we did our modelling, our projections showed that you do need a 12% contribution rate to be adequate, and that was for someone who's a median income earner. Now the scary thing is that everyone thinks that a WATI is the average well, you know, a WATI is the average income for a male, but the median income is actually only three quarters of a WATI. That means half the Australian population earns less than three quarters of a WATI. So for that median income earner to be adequate, if they work for 30 years, um, they need to be contributing 12%. If they had a bit longer working lifetime, so they didn't have as many gaps, they were working 35 years, um, then the average income earner, someone earning a WATI, would also be adequate on a 12% retirement income. But um, I guess that's really a key thing. We need the 12% to get us to that adequate level at the low income earner point. How do we get there? Should it be compulsory or should it be optional to put in the extra 3%? Um, there's a lot of debate still about that, that in the industry. We went with um, compulsory SG as the primary recommendation. However, if that's not possible, soft compulsion is the next best thing where people can opt out of that system if they really don't want it or can't afford it. Um, so you might have younger people opting out while they're trying to pay off their mortgage, for example. The other issue we really focused on was the gaps in the system, because a lot of people have broken work patterns, especially women and people that are caring for small families may have significant time out of the workforce or just working very much part-time. So they need the ability to catch up, and our current system with annual caps doesn't really allow catch up. So we asked the, um, the Treasury to have a think about that issue and how people like who've had a broken work pattern or immigrants coming into Australia in their mid-30s to mid-40s with no super, how do they catch up? So we need flexibility. The other thing we realised was that the self-employed, more and more people are becoming self-employed and self-employed people are having work patterns very similar to employees. I mean, how many people have contractors in their workplace that are pretty much acting just like an employee but they're a contractor? Um, so I think it's important that the SG also covers self-employed people and that would have to be phased in gradually but we've made a recommendation that um, SG up to 9% is phased in gradually for the self-employed as well. The other area I just want to touch on is longevity risk, and it's already been mentioned. Um, the risk of outliving your money is the key risk that we face as we live longer and longer. It's important to recognise this is linked to investment risk, because the more conservatively we, re we invest in retirement and the less we earn whilst we're retired, the more, we more longevity risk we're exposed to, the bigger the chance our money will run out. So the big question is, should people be compelled to ensure their longevity risk or defray their longevity risk? So there's two ways you can go. You can compel or you can encourage. The trouble is the products out there at the moment that let people um, manage their longevity risk, things like lifetime annuities, they don't sell. We all know this. They're not popular. People don't like particularly giving up access to their capital in retirement. So should there be compulsion? 
we recommended that you really do need to compel some form of insurance against longevity. Not necessarily you have to buy a particular product, but you have to protect yourself against the longevity risk so that we don't have everyone falling back on the age pension in their later years, which is pretty much the situation now. So our prediction is there will at some stage be that compulsion to ensure your longevity risk. And I think um, Louise mentioned um, the need for new product development in this space. We predict that you'll see a lot of changes in that area. We'll see a lot of innovation there um, and products where people can ensure their longevity risk without necessarily giving up access to their capital and products that are a bit more cost effective will become available. Thank you. Thanks, Andy. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be here and thanks for inviting uh, me today, Fiona and company. Uh, look, uh, our, uh, our message today is that we've got to be careful that we don't uh, destroy what, what's a good system coming out of the Henry Review. I think the Minister himself, when he talks about refurbishing the House, uh, makes an excellent analogy. Uh, this House does need refurbishing. We need to add a few rooms. We need to paint some others. I think we need to fix a few leaky pipes. And uh, we, we, what we don't need is a D9 Caterpillar or a Komatsu to come in and destroy what's a fantastic system. And so I just say that we've got to be very careful, both with the, the Sherry Renovating the House Review and the Longer Term Henry Review, that we don't destroy confidence in, in a good system. And a system right now which has massive confidence issues. Who could have expected uh, us to have uh, 30, 20, 30 billion dollars worth of frozen mortgage trust? Who could have expected that super funds would stop switching because they didn't have liquidity? Who would have expected co-contributions to be sagging? Who would have expected salary sacrifice right now to be plummeting? And we've got to be very careful the message we put out there. Uh, our message on the Henry Review uh, is a 10 point one, but I'll just go through a, just a couple because most of them have been repeated, uh, already said. Uh, one, one which we think is important for adequacy is that the tax office must release confidentialised household tax data on super cons and, uh, and tax and salary. That is important if we're going to work out what contributions are and what adequacy is. The second point, uh, we need to target the age pension. That's, it's obviously become, become too generous and we need to target it so as to reduce the long-term age pension outlays. Third point I'd make. Uh, we support SG going to 12, but if that's too hard, then do it through uh, soft compulsion. But always remember that we brought in the SG in economic hard times, when national savings were at their worst. And the final point I'd make, Sandy, is that uh, we need to encourage participation. Be careful not to throw out the baby with the bathwater in terms of the petition, participation uh, policy we have to encourage people to work longer. That is critical. We don't want to lose good people out of the workforce. That was always going to say. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Andy. Um, look, I think it's, it's, it's obviously uh, clear that there is a great degree of commonality uh, across the panel and across the organisations too, and I think that's welcome. Um, there's an assessment that uh, the real politic is that, you know, certainly not in this budget or any immediate future budgets will there be uh, the introduction of compulsory increase, uh, compulsory contributions. Um, we reached that conclusion not only because we were working with the ACTU and the AI group and it was quite clear that there was no commonality of view between those two parties, um, but also in discussions with the government and, and with Treasury. With that in mind, um, when we did the modelling with Access Economics, we were in some ways almost relieved to find that it's not only looking at the real politic which is going to govern whether or not increased contributions um, are likely but also the fact that it may in fact not be immediately necessary. Um, now we sort of, we will reserve the right to continue to mine the data a little bit better. The fact that the um, requirement for submissions was brought forward by some months meant that we, um, we still wanted a little bit of work. But what has become clear out of the work that Access Economics have done is that if you can improve the efficiency of our system um, by somewhere in the order of 75 basis points, that is almost equivalent to increasing con compulsory contributions to 12%. So if we can improve the efficiency across the system by 75 basis points, that's almost equivalent to increasing compulsory contributions to 12%. And that's the modelling that's, well that's the outcome that's come from the modelling we did with Access Economics. And so I think that puts the industry, all of us, in a quite an interesting position because you know, we're in a situation here where we, we receive tax concessions of somewhere in the order of 25 billion. 
We receive compulsory contributions per annum somewhere in the order of between 40 and 50 billion. Um, about 15, 15 billion dollars has been charged in fees across the industry. Um, and obviously, you know, last year was not a, a stellar year for investment performance, so quite a bit was actually wiped off the total assets of the industry, a couple of hundred billion by my estimates. So whilst we've called for an increase in the SG in the long term, in, as everyone else has, what we were looking at is what ways can the government, um, through the Henry process or through another process, actually get the industry itself to be more efficient to deliver some savings to members. And this is a way in which it doesn't deliver any trade-offs either. So this isn't uh, about making employers increase their contributions or employees um, increase contributions. It's also not about looking at the tax system necessarily, although we've also advocated that. This is a way in which we can look at the practices we've currently got in our industry, look at some of the inefficiencies we've got in our industry, sharpen the pencil on those, reform some of those practices, and actually make sure that given we have, this is not only a very unique industry, but we're in a very privileged position, um, that we can actually make sure that we're acting in the best interest of all members and we're delivering to working Australians uh, maximum efficiency of a system. Now, I just want to briefly, um, and I'm happy to perhaps discuss some of those options uh, a little bit later, but just, just give a little bit more data on this. What we found is that it said if you increase the aggregate rate of return by 75 basis points, that could increase assets by 19% by 2041. We found that it would be the equivalent of giving um, or increasing the annual pension to someone by four, uh, $1,450, which, just out of interest, is pretty much what we're expecting the government um, to do something in order of that in this budget. We expect they'll increase the age pension by around and about $1,400. Improving the efficiency within our system in today's dollars would, would increase a comparable amount, would deliver people a comparable amount. Um, and finally, as I said right at the, the, the offset here, increasing performance by 75 basis points would be roughly equivalent to increasing compulsory contributions to 12%. So I think it's incumbent upon all of us, it's incumbent upon industry funds, public sector funds, corporate funds and retail funds, it's incumbent upon all of us to make sure we fully understand what all the practices and the structural inefficiencies we've got which, which are meaning we don't have the most efficient system, the most competitive system, and to look at reforming that. Thank you all. Louise, there's, there's certainly no shortage of advice being given to government uh, through all the submissions. Mm -hmm. What do you think the biggest challenge confronting them will be in, uh, mm -hmm. in coming to some decision making? Um, yeah, I think the biggest challenge, apart from just reading all those submissions and, and consolidating into useful information, is to really is the whole issue on adequacy um, and ensuring that we have adequate levels for all Australians and looking at the different needs. We also think that there's a different way that you will view adequacy from a policy perspective than the way our members and clients will actually view adequacy as well. Um, largely, you can see the government moving towards wanting a percentage basis for a policy perspective because it helps them set parameters, but most clients think about it in dollar terms as well. Um, so we support, very similar to what Fiona was saying as well, is looking at that two-tiered level with a cap on it. Um, and I think e even if you look at Treasury figures that they're predicting by 2047, which is 10 years after the SG becomes a fully mature system, that we're still going to have 75 per cent of people getting some form of age pension with the current system and current rules. So supporting that, maintaining adequacy and funding that level of support um, I think is really their biggest challenge to see how they can do it more efficiently. Good. Melinda, you, you mentioned lifetime annuities and, and one of the reasons why people don't like them is the cost, uh, apart from the fact they give up the control of their capital. Uh, do you see a new range of products being able to be delivered more cost effectively than the current range? Yeah, it's interesting. There's a lot of work being done in this area at the moment and I think um, the, the main cost in these products is actually ensuring the investment risk and if you decouple the investment risk and the longevity risk you, know, you can actually get quite a cost effective way to ensure your longevity risk by having a small give up each year as a premium or a deduction from the return. So there's these sorts of products are starting to be developed and I'd really encourage um, trustees to you know, find out what their members want in this area and really have a look at some of those really exciting new developments. Um, we need to remove the roadblocks to let some of these products come through. Um, it's also interesting to see um, the proposal put forward by the Institute of Actuaries on the age pension, which I think would also help in this area, which is if you're eligible for the pension, 
um, when you retire at 65, but you use your own super up first and delay the age at which you start the age pension, it gets higher. So boosting the existing pension bonus scheme. I think these sorts of measures will really start to help so someone can say, right, I'll use my, I know how long my own super has to last, and then from a certain age I know I've either got the age pension or I've got my insured um, uh, lifetime pension from age 85 that I've paid for myself. That'll make that equation much easier, take out the how long am I going to live out of the equation. Okay. David, you've spoken generally about efficiencies and efficiency gains in the system. Have you got any specifics you want to put on the table? Look, I've just, I mean, I think, I think th three examples, and um, I won't pick on Richard's funds entirely here. We'll perhaps have a look at ourselves as well. I think, I think, firstly, we, and particularly the industry fund sector, need to have a good look at fund consolidation. Um, some research which fell off the back of a truck this week and which I had a look at would indicate that the difference between uh, in terms of performance, net performance, the difference um, between l the larger funds and the smaller funds is growing. And there is a clearly a correlation, and Rainmaker did some work a couple of years ago on this, there's clearly a correlation between fund size and net performance. So there is a capacity there uh, for our system to deliver those workers in those funds superior performance by looking at fund consolidation. Now it's not, a, it's not an e easy thing to discuss and there's a lot of resistance to it, a lot of which is um, for a number of obvious reasons, but I do think it's something we need to have a look at. The second point is something which is front of mind um, with the government at the moment, and something which I think all every sector needs to have a good look at, look at which is you know lost super multiple accounts. We just can't ignore it. I think there is a, a tendency for people to put their head in the sand um, across all sectors, and I think this is going to be one of those situations where we're probably going to have a solution enforced upon us. Um, and, and it may not be one that uh, we all welcome. So I think that's something which, again, we all need to have a look at. There are legitimate reasons for people to have more than one account quite often, but there isn't you know, really a legitimate reason for there to be somewhere in the order of 26 million accounts. The, f the final thing, and uh, uh, most obvious, and, and, and quite, quite clearly where the biggest change can be made is, is just within um, the situation we've got with sales commissions, with conflicts of interest as well. Uh, the data is regularly out there. Um, you know, what we've got here, and I, I, I'm going to paraphrase but hopefully not misquote um, Warren Chan, and I'm relying on, so on media reports here, so I'm happy to be picked up. But a comment that Warren's made more recently is that the 6% differential in outperformance between industry funds and retail funds is not sustainable. Now, I think that's obvious. It's, it's, uh, it's obvious. I mean, if there was a 6% differential over a long period of time, there'd have to be a royal commission in, into the superannuation industry, not a review. But the second part, and the comment which is now being regularly um, published, is that that differential should normalise to 2%. So we now sort of seem to be in a situation where we, the market accepts that it is fine for one sector to outperform the other sector in the long term by somewhere in the order of 2%. And I think that that is, is doing, an in, that, that, that's doing damage to the retirement savings of the workers which are in those underperforming funds. And we've got to have a look at the system which is delivering that, and the principal issue, of course, is commissions and conflicts of interest. Okay, Richard, uh, word on the street is that you're so frequently in the parliament that security ask you if they can get in, rather than the <laughs> other way around. Um, yeah. Yeah. What have you heard on the grapevine about the uh, super and the budget? Look, I think the budget deficit uh, that the government is, it's spinning out of control, uh, and, and it's going to be very difficult for this industry to expect any, any favourable outcomes. Uh, I think uh, the age pension issue probably might even be up for grabs, because uh, that's, again, a lot of money compared to what the budget deficit is. Uh, we're living in very difficult times there. And, and I think it's been disappointing that uh, we haven't actually played off the same hymn sheet in, in respect of some of the things uh, that, we, that, that the budget might steal. For example, the co-contribution. I think that would be a big loss. And, and similarly, the transition of retirement issue, that, that again, could be a big loss for us. Um, and so. Uh, I, I just think the, tre the Treasury officials would be salivating at the prospect of taking money from us and not giving it back in this budget. And we'll never get it back because the budget is for a long time going to be in deficit. Okay. Finally, Fiona, uh, when the pension age was set at 65, the average life expectancy for blokes was 58 and for women it was about 60. Now it's in the mid-70s at birth and the mid-80s uh, at, uh, for someone who's you know, my young age, 65. Um, do you think that it's time for us to review uh, the pension age? Uh, no, I don't. Um, 
I think that this is one of these areas that issues that comes up all the time and different groups come out and say that we need to put the age pension up, that that's going to be the answer to all of the problems. We need to recognise that there's always going to be workers out there who, once they get to 65 years old, you know, they've done their work, they've been bricklayers or things like this, they've, their back's done, they're not going to be able to work past 65. Mm. And there's certain, you know, there's articles or there's commentators who say, oh, well, those people can just go and have a disability pension. Mm -hmm. And I think it is incredibly insulting to say to people who have worked mm -hmm. all of their lives mm -hmm. hard in this country mm -hmm. that, no, you don't get to retire with dignity like everybody else. You can just go off and be on some disability pension. So we definitely think and have suggested in our submission that the government does everything that it can to encourage people who, who are able to stay in the workforce, that they do stay in the work workforce longer. At the moment, there is the bonus scheme for people to put off taking the age pension. But in 2008, with those bonuses, less than 5% of people actually took it up. So there's a lot more work that can be done for delaying the age pension. And Melinda touched on a few things that the Institute of um, Actuaries have said. We've also suggested that within that, that we have a look at the generosity of the taper rates. At the moment, for the age pension, you can earn up to somewhere up to around about $800,000 and still now get some form of age pension. And that's just far too generous. We think there needs to be things looked at there. And then we can afford to have people still retiring at age 65 who need to, but keep everybody who wants to work longer. And then just in terms of lifetime annuity products, we've, we've agreed with that, but we've, I suppose we've come at it from a slightly different point of view. We've recognised, as the other speakers have said, that the market in Australia is underdeveloped and that there's limited products. And we recognise that our system isn't fully mature. So we've still got a lot of people who are still reti retiring with, say, their lump sums, $100,000, $150,000, and that's going to go on for a long time. And those people take their lump sum and, you know, they might pay a bit of mortgage, a bit of debt, they might go on a bit of holiday, they might help their kids out, they might buy some new white goods that are going to set them up, all of those sorts of things. And after they've done all of that, they've got about $60,000 left. And really there's not going to be any great products out there for people who have got $60,000 to last them a lifetime. So we looked at what happens around the world, what happens in different countries. And borrowing a bit from the UK model, although our suggestion's a bit different, we've suggested that people at the lower end should be able to buy a top up to the age pension. Because at the end of the day, the government is the insurer of longevity risk because when you've run out of other money, the government's paying you an age pension. And because we've got the age pension and all the systems that are in place, we also believe that there's lots of cost savings there. And we also think that it might cover off some of the advice issues because if you basically are getting your age pension and then you're buying your top up, maybe you know, you can get that advice from the government, but you don't need to go and get some complicated advice. It's all very straightforward. And we tried to look in our submission about people um, at the lower end, you know, they go to work every fortnight, they get their pay packet, and they want some certainty in retirement. And maybe they're not getting a lot of money this way, but they know that every fortnight, until I die, I am going to get X amount of money. And we've seen in this, current volatility, that it is the retirees who have been suffering, particularly retirees at the lower end. And so we've tried to think about how can we re remove some of that volatility for those people and how can we give them a little bit more security in retirement. The age pension, uh, should it be a safety net or should it be uh, more universally available given that 81 per cent of Australians over the age of 65 currently gets whole or part pension? So if we just go along. Yep. Um, ultimately, we? we believe it should be a safety net. We may need a bit of a transition period to get there. Um, but a safety net, when we also encourage people to have their own adequate savings, um, we also have put into our submission 
a different dif um, pension bonus mechanism where the deferral is an increased pension rather than a lump sum. And um, yeah, so basically a safety net. We think it should be primarily a safety net, but recognising that until ESG systems mature in 2035, there's still a significant role for it to play as a supplement because otherwise people just do not have enough when they retire now. Um, even when the system is mature in 2035, um, ASPA thinks it still will have a role to play as a supplement, but that will be the minority. So we'll go from a system where people are maj majority relying on the age pension to from 2035 when you've had SG your whole life, you're primarily relying on your own. But we still think that the supplement role will always play a part for that sort of awati and lower income level. Uh, definitely a more targeted safety net. I should say that Sandy used to open every single meeting we had about this with exactly the same question. <laughs> so it's probably testing our um, whether we. No, I might. Just um, testing it. I might the same I might. answer from you now as you go. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Um, it's a broader point, though, isn't it? Which hopefully we'll um, we will have a look at uh, in in the next period of time. But and it's a broader point about the equity of the taxation of superannuation uh, and the equity of the system itself. And you know, at the end of the day, the government is going to be looking at how it can distribute its tax dollars and how it does that in, in an equitable way. And one of the, the elephant in the room in all of this Henry review and all the discussions we're having is, is are the better super reforms um, and the fact that they are unsustainable, the fact that they only really did projections, I understand, till 2010-11. Um, and from our, our, the work that we've done and the modelling we did with Access Economics would, in, would suggest that by the time we get um, to 2040, uh, the, the, the cost of those better super uh, uh, reforms is somewhere in the order of 3% of GDP. So it's been put out of scope, but it was put out of scope well before the current uh, financial crisis, and I think we'd be hoping that the government would be putting it back in scope and having a look at some way in which those better super reforms, and in particular, of course, tax-free super when you retire, um, is reviewed, and that has to be part of an answer to, to the, having a more equitable system. Okay, we've now got half an hour set aside for questions from the floor, so who's going to go first? Hi, Lorraine Behrens from Marvin & Palmer. Could you stand up, Lorraine? Thanks. Sorry, Sandy. Yeah. The, um, the, if I, unless I misunderstood, the main difference, or really the one difference between the submissions seemed to be around the age pension, so since we, we've just been talking about that. Uh, Fiona, I think you said in the AISTISN submission that you were recommending an increase to the age pension, where others are... I think if we're talking about decrease. I'm just wondering about the costing around that. You talked a little about your costing, and I know you didn't have much opportunity to go into detail, but it, it sort of seems with concerns about costs, I'm just interested to know how that, that sort of all pans out with other costs related to super. Well, the reason that we said the $16,000, I suppose, is because we recognise that uh, pensioners are doing it tough out there and that it's about time that we did have a decent a decent rise and we used the amount, the government gave a bonus to pensioners in December and we used that amount, I think it was, was it 1600 David? The 14. 1400. So we used that amount to say let's annually have that in there, not as a bonus but let's add it to the age pension. And I suppose we also added it in there because the government has made some noises about putting up the age pension. So we've wanted to be supportive of that for retirees. I can't remember, I have to say, Sasha's probably here somewhere. He's the brainiac in all of this. Um, and will probably know the figure off the top of his head, but I can't remember how much that increase would cost. Foot number four, and while they're doing that, Richard, uh, I didn't get that impression that no. uh, if so were... No, no, we, uh, we, we're somewhat agnostic about pension levels because they're not our constituency, so we didn't venture into that. What we did say was that the, the, the pension bill's gonna blow out and uh, actually David's right about the 3%, actually it's, I think it's 3.5 by 2046, uh, that's the fiscal gap, a and clearly um, it's going to be worse than that because of uh, the way, way the uh, pension drawdown's going now. Uh, so uh, we, uh, we, we took a view that it needs to be better targeted and we've got to keep the total cost down and the government needs to display that total cost more prominently in the way it advertises its spending. Ramani from APRA. Um I must uh, clarify that uh, the comment I'm making is not in an APRA capacity, but rather in a personal capacity. That's why I'm lurking in a corner and speaking slowly. <laughs> um, 
I wonder in dealing with this very complex and difficult issue, why there is a market reluctance to touch a few holy cows, like the freedom from gift tax in this country, or the sacrosanct nature of your family home, where you can be asset rich, leave it to your children and grandchildren, but still suck on the taxpayer. When are we going to realize that at some point in time we need to create a statutory reverse mortgage on assets beyond a certain level? When will we have interest, intestinal fortitude to do that? I think we'll get comment from all five people from that. <laughs> uh, so starting with you, David. We'll come well, down the table. Well, the other thing that Sandy would start every single meeting we had with this, was this <laughs> debate about the family home as well. So, um, and we used to spend a good time debating that. The, I, th I think you're probably right about uh, reverse mortgages. That's probably the answer. And, and what we need is a, a reasonable model in there. And there's a whole set of issues around the sale of reverse mortgages. But you know, th I think one of the big issues is getting to a point where you're saying to someone that the value of, the value of their home may have increased and they may, in fact, be asset rich, but they may also be living alone. It may be the place they lived for 40 years. It may be the place we've got incredible emotional attachment to where their, their, their kids, their grandkids all return to. And that home and, and may well be an asset, but in fact it's, much, it's worth much more to them and worth much more to their life. And we have to be very careful about not just looking at the balance sheet on some of these issues, but actually looking at, um, at the quality of people's lives too. Yeah, look, we get, I just think we've got to be careful about getting... I think Remini says it all when he talks about sacred cows. I, I just think our industry has to be very careful about venturing into areas which when we attack, we're then seen as nakedly, vestedly self-interested. And so therefore, I just, I just think we've got to be very careful and uh, I think let others raise these things and for us to join the debate. We um, had a lot of debate around the family home issue and of course any government that introduced it, it would be instant political suicide. So I think we have to be realistic about whether it would ever get done. Um, the other issue is of course how, there's so many practicalities around it. I mean, how do you, um, compare someone living in Sydney with someone living in a small regional town. You know, what level do you put the, the asset test at for it? I mean, it makes logical sense to do it, but the practicalities are so difficult. In our submission, we said, yes, government should look at it, they should consider it. Also, it's important to recognise that when the systems mature in the 2030s, there may not be as high ownership of homes as there are now. So will it even be an issue for future generations, this massive store of wealth in the family home? Before we get too excited about it, we've got to really consider that. But it is a very inefficient way that, that retirees do things now because they have to s buy and sell houses and gradually downsize to release that capital. It's means tested when it comes out of the family home, so it's inefficient, it's wasteful. Um, so if you were going to do it, you'd have to have better reverse mortgage products and a deeper market there. Um, I, I would agree with all the comments so far. It is a very... Um emotionally charged issue and I know in, in where I live in Sydney is an inner city suburb and you've got a lot of very elderly people who live there, bought their homes you know, 50, 60 years ago for £10,000. We yuppies have now moved in and pushed their prices up so they're sitting on million dollar homes. Now is it fair to ask them to sell up and move to a suburb they've never lived in, they have no friends, they don't know the facilities, the public transport probably sucks and that's a very technical word. Um, <laughs> just because we've pushed their market price up. So it, it's a very difficult issue. It is an issue that Treasury is very keen to look at and to try and address. Um, we do need much better products to help people in this market so that they're not forced out if it does ever come into it. One of the things that the Financial Planning Association has put into our submission is in relation to the age pension. We're looking at a single means test and by looking at that one of the things we want to do is to encourage people to use all of their assets equally to support themselves but with exceptions and we have specifically excluded the home in that test but it does pick up all other assets such as holiday homes and, and other non-income producing assets and assigns a, a deemed income against them so that they're then forced to make decisions about the value of maintaining that and using it to support themselves and provide an income. So th there's some exceptions in there, but it's essentially along that m model we're looking at. Well, I think reverse mortgages are appalling products. If people, the ones out there at the moment are particularly appalling pl products, so I don't know that we should be doing more work on reverse mortgages. 
I agree with what people have said. I mean, you, you have particularly a lot of elderly widows out there who are living in homes, as Louise said, that they've, they, they bought them a long, long time ago. But the problem is that if they sell that home, they're removing that asset from being an asset that's not considered when you're with for your age pension into an asset that will be considered and the only and, and the only money they have they might have all these assets but the only actual income they have is the age pension they get worried about that they get concerned about losing age pension so we need to come up with an equitable way of addressing that um, I think, though, we also need to be careful. There's a lot of particularly older women in, in our society who've never had access to superannuation. They never got it. And, you know, we don't want to be taking away from those people. We want to find better things for elder, older Australians, particularly older women in our society. I don't want the, the fact that we gave five answers to Romney's question to be an incentive for people to hide in the dark. Number three <laughs> down here. Uh, uh, Michael Wantcare, Super. Um, in relation to the adequacy, the 12 per cent, is that net of the contribution tax? And I'm, I am aware that I think that AIST submission does talk about the contribution tax yep. uh, being removed for low income earners? We, I mean, we all know that if you're a higher income earner and you're on the top uh, top tax of 40, 45 cents, you're getting a good deal out of super at 15%, but at the lower end where you pay no tax or where, you're, where you pay 15% tax, that you're getting a, a bad deal out of super. So we did quite a few, model quite a few, few different scenarios. And what we, what we found that gave people the best outcomes was that where you were earned no tax, that you got a rebate of your 15% contributions tax, sorry, where you paid no tax, and that where you paid tax up to 15%, that you paid no contribution tax. It's a bit complicated, but it was the most equitable and had the bit the best outcome. But this is an area I think we all agree, all the organisations agree, that something definitely needs to um, happen. Yeah. Your and submission, Melinda, you, yeah. you, you majored I, on this in your submission. I think everybody, all of, pretty much all of the submissions said pretty much the same thing along these lines. The, the way we thought the co-contribution, if it's still around, mechanism would be a good way to get that money back to people. Um, but yeah, you definitely need to look at that low end. And also, we said extend the co-contribution mechanism a little higher. Everyone up to a WATI level should have that co-contribution, so that sort of lower middle income earner level also needs a little bit of help. Given that um, the panel itself can't agree about whether the pension is big enough or should be smaller, and noting that um, for the last, um, well, 30 years, uh, we've had not the bargaining about the age pension because we've had a bipartisan policy and a formula called 25% of average weekly male earnings and given that most people who rely entirely on the pension are women, that's an equity issue too, are you saying that this should also disappear because it doesn't appear in anybody's submission and if the government is going to <clears throat> give a one-off increase now how are we going to maintain equity for the aged pensioners by having a formula that is set and is above government backdoor trading? Yeah, look, we, uh, we support the, uh, the, tw the 25 or 26% AWU pension. Uh, comment, Can I just say, we, we actually suggested that a better measure would be to develop a proper retirement price index and index it by that because um, AWATI and those measures are based on uh, you know, salaries and, and, and when you're in salaries it's all about how much income you get in. Once you retire it's all about what expenditure you actually need. So we suggested the ideal is to develop a retirement price index, use that to um, use as an inflation measure. N if that doesn't happen then we said we supported the system that we've got now with the AWATI and CPI. We're not suggesting that the government put up the age pension to $16,000 for a single person and then for, then forget about it and don't have um, or proper increases as they already do. We would, we would expect and want that to continue. 
Any other comments? We recommended that it's indexed to a WATI, not CPI, to maintain real standards of living. Okay, down the front here. Uh, <coughs> Graham Number three. Russell. First super and media super. Um, uh, just to continue a conversation with you, David, I think on industry consolidation, as you know, uh, I was involved in three, five funds going into two last June. Now, whilst the government's announced uh, potentially CGT rollover relief, to me that's just removing a, an illogical disincentive to mergers. But the other disincentive is that these are costly exercises and in an era of uh, negative returns, which fund is going to take on the huge costs that, in the funds that are left behind, have to be written off that year because you're not allowed to group losses and carry forward losses? Um, do you think that the government needs to do something policy-wise, or could you think of some ideas, to incentivise funds to uh, go through the consolidation process uh, rather than, with the five funds that I was involved in, having to wear all of the costs and even without the removal of the illogical disincentive. Richard. Yeah, yeah, I don't mind going first on this and say, look, I agree that um, the government needs to look at this more comprehensively. Uh, we've put to the government uh, a proposal on product rationalisation, which unfortunately has been rolled into refurbishing the house. That might take 18 months to do. And I think we need these things running now. We also need to look at the regulatory impediments. They're costly, you know that. Sign off this, sign off that, member consent, depending on the fund and the type it is in. in. And I think that's, this should be brought forward now to help the industry. I'd, I'd agree. Oh, sorry, after David. That's <laughs> fine. Uh, absolutely no objection to encouraging the government to, you know, ease, ease, ease the road, make it easier. I think in, in one way, um, indirectly, certainly, award modernisation will um, create some imperative. But I think the, the, the point that I was trying to make at the start um, is that it's also about us. This that we can always come up with a million and one excuses why we don't do something, and then we can blame the government because they haven't made it easier. We collectively are working in an incredible in an industry which has an incredibly privileged position, and there is sufficient data out there to indicate that, um, on average, but by and large, um, th there's a correlation between fund size and net performance. Um, and there's a whole set of reasons for that. Um, I think that we need to, in part, be honest with ourselves to say this is where there will have to be fund consolidation and we're often, we're better off just taking control of it ourselves rather than waiting for the government either to make it easier or in some ways to make the conditions so hard that it's ineffectively being mandated. So, you know, a lot of what I'm you know, trying to say today is that we collectively, all of us here, are going to have to get hold of some of the inefficiencies, which not necessarily always intended but some of the inefficiencies and some of the practices which we, we, know, we just know are wrong and, and address them and, and, and we should be running the agenda ourselves, particularly when you're delivering returns of you know, double, negative double digits. ASFA's just kicked off a working group on this. I know a number of you have already put your hands up to be on it, but we want to put to government a package of legislative changes to remove all those impediments that funds have currently got to either merging or closing down legacy products. Um, but yeah, there, there are definitely some practical and legislative impediments, so let's get them all on the table and get them fixed. Alan Fazeldy in QIEC Super. Did any of the submissions address the question of uh, the healthcare card? Um, people structure their uh, income and their assets in such a way that they, you know, they're $2 less than the blooming level, so they get do at least a dollar a week or a dollar a fortnight or such and such per fortnight just so they get the healthcare care card? In our submission, Alan, we recognised exactly what you've just said and, and said that basically it, you know, drives some very bad behaviour in terms of people going off to, you know, see a planner working out as many ways as they can possibly to get that healthcare card. So I suppose we, we said, well, OK, so as it has its use, use by date, could we do this better? Is it that we need to put more money into Medicare to fund health, pay a higher Medicare level or something like that, and then give everybody over a certain age, say 65, some sort of seniors card where they get other discounts? So we didn't have all of the answers to it because it was going into another area in health and that was going to be a whole lot of other modelling, but we certainly touched on it and raised those issues and said we really believe that the government needs to address it. 
The areas that we looked at in relation to healthcare card is one of the things that um, we find very difficult is the difference, the number of cards you have and the differences between them and the differences between states. So he said the first thing the government really needs to do is just unify all of that because that will get rid of a lot of administration and make the system more affordable. So we suggested that you actually get rid of the Commonwealth Seniors Health Card, give everybody who's eligible the pension concession cards are just extended out so you've got one card, uniform benefits, reduce the administration across there. What level you set it at is something we would need to discuss. The other thing we have a particular problem with at the moment is the legislation the government's putting through that changes the income test with income streams for the Commonwealth Seniors Health Card because it creates an inequity with people who have money in investments like term deposits or unit trusts where it's only the taxable income that will count if you're in an income stream, all of your capital that you're drawing out, as well as the returns you're drawing out, is going to count as income. So we think that's an error they've made and we want them to reverse that. Um, but a lot of ours is around just getting rid of the inequities to make it more efficient. Joe Gallagher from CBOS. Regarding self-employed, <coughs> recognising that there's huge numbers, growing numbers, any ideas how we could actually collect money from self-employed people to start encouraging those people to grow in funds. Because uh, particularly in the construction industry, at the end of the year, a self-employed person goes to the accountant and uh, they're very, very good at reducing $200,000 income to $56,000 income. And uh, just has there been any discussion as to how uh, we could tackle that issue? Melinda? Yes, we were, when we appeared before the Henry panel the first time, they challenged us on that and said, look, you want to include the self-employed, how would you do it practi practically? So we, the only way, we, we thought about it long and hard, the only way you can do it is through the tax return. So somebody has to do it. Um, uh, they, if they've done it during the year themselves, they're fine, but if they haven't done it, then the money's collected at tax return time or they have to make the payment at that point. It can only ever be done on their taxable income. We need to recognise that self-employed people often do build up um, wealth in their own business as well, so you might have a higher limit on how much they, income they have to have SG applied to, um, recognising that they build wealth in other ways, um, so quite a lot of them do. So, But yeah, tax return is the only practical way you can make sure it happens. David, did you want to... Yeah, just briefly. The, the, the other emphasis on this, of course, is the definition of what someone is, or, or someone who is self-employed. Um, and this would be an issue within the construction industry where there's plenty of 18-year-old apprentices which are suddenly these uh, small business people. Um, and that was a lot of the emphasis of, of the submission that we made, which is to make sure that people who in effect are subcontractors or theoretically self-employed, but the reality is of course are actually employees, and to make sure that this is not an issue of them deciding not to make contributions, but in fact um, they just simply don't have the opportunity to make the contributions. Someone mentioned earlier that the, uh, there was an elephant in the room, and I think the elephant's twin sister is the, uh, the question of, of lump sums versus pensions. We seem to be uh, studiously avoiding that, that concept. Uh, would someone like to express a view as to how the future should look? Um, in, in our submission, one of our major focus was we need to create an income stream culture. So we think we do need to move people more towards taking income streams. We aren't proposing that by any means of compulsion because we see so many different circumstances with clients. They get to retirement with various levels of savings. They have various health issues, various um, residence requirements. And so to actually mandate that they take a certain amount as an income stream, we, we just think is inflexible. So it does need to be around um, incentives to encourage people to do that. I think a lot of it is around advice and a lot of what we find from anecdotal evidence and experience with our clients as well is that those who get access to advice tend to take income streams more than those who are making their own decisions without any level of advice at all. And I think one of the things as well is the government needs to give us some level of consistency in the rules. Um, I see a lot of clients as well who are very afraid of putting their money into an income stream. They'd rather take it out and put it into a bank account because they think that at some moment in time the government is going to just mandate that they cannot get their money back out. And so there's a high level of fear which is counterproductive to what we actually want to generate. 
Come in, Bridget. Yeah, I just think we've got to be, again, uh, on, on this, I think we're very careful not to hand back to government something which the industry has done. And it's re I always am reassured when I see the industry funds out there with their allocated pension products. I think uh, giving government the right to give people pensions uh, which they buy, I think that would be a very dangerous incursion into the idea of private sector provision through a multiplicity of outlets which we have, which we've established over 20 years, I think, I think it would be a very retrograde move because very quickly you'd find the front end nationalised, the default funds nationalised, and then perhaps uh, the, the, uh, the non-default funds. I think we've got a ma magnificent system and to let it go back into government hands is the opposite to what the, the founders of this system put in place. Fiona, have you got a... Yeah, well, I just think, yeah, we do have a good system, but it's not perfect, it's far from perfect. And what we've tried to do, I suppose, from coming from the point of view of having the government um, provide some top-up annuities for the lower paid is to say, well, there is nothing out there really for those people. And we need to be concerned about those as well. And that the only way to really get the products that we need is through, is through the government. There was apparently 50 annuities sold last year. Yeah. But, but Sandy, with respect, uh, I'm talking about the allocated pension market, which most funds here have got into. Uh, you've put together, I think, very effective financial planning networks. Uh, and I, my anecdotal evidence is that people can get cheap advice and that they can get a good, transparent income stream. We're not suggesting that those things go away or that there is no private provision uh, at all, just that there should be some options. Greg Bright, Investment Technology. Question for Louise. Um, if David is going to get his 75 basis points in savings, uh, uh, he believes that the bulk of that will come from reducing the cost of advice. Um, putting aside your philosophical view, um, do you actually think that um, it is possible to implement a system whereby um, commissions are banned on advice in relation to superannuation guarantee? It, uh, and, and also, would you think that those sort of numbers, that sort of saving, would be delivered you know, uh, if the government did introduce that? I thought I was going to get through this whole panel without one of those questions. <laughs> 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 yeah. I, I think the issue is not, um, is, you know, is, your question you asked was, is it possible to have a system where you ban it? Well, it is if the government legislates it. Is it a good system? I would have to argue that it's probably not, not going to be a good system. What we're looking at more is that you need to have a system where there is transparency around the fees, that the clients understand what they're being charged and that they actually value what they're getting. Now, where that fee comes from, whether it's them paying it out of their pocket or whether it's coming out of their investment, should be able to be their choice. Um, and there are different taxation benefits and implications of doing either of those as well. In our review in here, we did touch on the issue around fees, but. Uh, we didn't go into it in a large degree because there is a whole separate review that's actually looking at that. We're participating in that review and putting a lot of information into there. So I think some more detailed answers, and I'm sorry I can't answer your question in too much detail at the moment, but there's a lot more that will come out of that review and we really welcome what comes out of it. Richard, my only comment, uh, Greg, uh, through Sandy, uh, is that uh, the, if you look at the list of AIRC default funds that have been established, I don't know there's any commissions being paid. And as that runs through the system, uh, and if retail funds are ever allowed back in as default funds, I don't think the criteria will allow them to have 50 basis points for a commission, Greg. And, and also, I think the market is moving against commissions very solidly, and I'll, I'll show you products, retail products that have no commissions. And, and, uh, and have other, other products, and, and they're out there, the, the, the great bulk of funds now 50% of them at least, uh, no commissions. And people, but but the, the, uh, the difficulty here is as soon as this issue, debate raises its ugly head, which it always does at this conference, uh, as soon as it does, you then start talking about advice in product and p taking out uh, $1,000 to go and see David's outfit, IFFP. I think if we let this debate run its course, then you'd, be, you'd have people, and I can't see any tax relief coming on having the advice paid for out of the product. I think it would be very detrimental to the funds that are trying to give advice at an affordable rate in the product, and that has a lot of tax advantages. So I think, again, let's be cautious about how we let this debate run out because the market is running very much against commissions. One last comment, David, before yeah. we wrap up. Well, just one brief comment on that. I, I think um, banning commissions on SG isn't, isn't the solution. 
Um, it's got to be much, much, much wider than that now. Um, I think it'd be quite possible to, I mean, the, the government could legislate to ban commissions on SG. I think that the technology exists with the major platform providers and retail funds to be able to switch off that component. Um, but that's not sufficient. Uh, the issue isn't just the cost of the commission, which is about a billion dollars a year on SG and about two and a half billion dollars a year in total, but it isn't just the cost of that. It's actually the cost of people being recommended, sold, sold underperforming products. Um, it's a situation where the best performing funds are industry super funds, um, and yet you cannot get access to these, typically, if you go and see a financial planner. And that is the broader issue. So it's not just about the 50 basis points, it's the cost of someone being sold an underperforming fund. And at that point, we need to wrap up because we've reached the allotted time. Thank you for your participation as an audience. Uh, the questions have been uh, very, very illuminating. Uh, would you join with me in thanking them for uh, their, their input?